You are listening to the 39th broadcast of TBR Radio's TBR History Hour with your host, TBR contributing editor, Dr. Edward DeVries. On today's show, Dr. Ed talks to Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Kennedy, retired professor of military history at the Army Staff College in Leavenworth, Kansas. Professor Kennedy talks about the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Now to talk about the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Sounds like a bad Chinese restaurant, doesn't it? Dien Bien Phu. <laughs> Absolutely. That was in the first uh, Indochina War. I saw that on Wikipedia, so I'm guessing it was like maybe a precursor to, to Vietnam? Well, to our Vietnam, of course, the Vietnamese have been fighting for years against the Chinese, the Japanese, the French, and then us. What we know is the Vietnam War, was that just basically the United States involving itself in an ongoing Indo-Chinese War, or kind of explain that then? Yes, absolutely. Well, the Japanese had taken over from the French, a colonial power that had been in Vietnam since the 18, 1800s. They had, the French had gone in there and colonized um, Vietnam in order to get the resources from it and they had opened up a number of different concerns there like the uh, Michelin rubber concern there's there's all sorts of things they were able to get from Vietnam as part of the colony you know grabbing business they went through in the 1800s and it was all about you know keeping up with with the Joneses the British the Germans everybody else trying to get colonies the French thought it was their kind of their place to grab colonies too. And of course, it became more important with the steamship navies to have coaling stations and places they could put in around the world to get re re supplies and replenishment. So the French were in there for a long time. When the, when the wars in Asia began with the Japanese in the 1930s, um, the French got caught up. And of course, when the Germans invaded France. The Japanese went after the uh, French in Indochina as part of their aggrandizement of, of gathering nations that they needed for their own purposes. So the Japanese went up against the French. The French signed a treaty with them. They kept the French forces in Indochina under Japanese control. What happened is at the end of World War II, um, we tried to get this group of communists, the Viet Minh, which were under uh, Ho Chi Minh, we tried to get them to fight the Japanese with us as part of the coalition to help us fight the Japanese and get them out of there. When the Japanese were defeated, the French were going to come back into Indochina, but they were too slow in getting there, and the Viet Minh, the communists, had a foothold already, and they decided they were going to install their own government. The French showed back up and forced them out, forced them to go into uh, the mountains. And that's when they began their guerrilla warfare against the French. So from 45 to 54, when they had the, uh, the disaster at Dien Bien Phu, the French were fighting a major insurgency and counterinsurgency against the Viet Minh, which were the communists. That's what led to the big battle at Dien Bien Phu. The, the French were trying to figure out how to fight an insurgency using conventional war tactics, which was inappropriate for what they were doing. This battle I'm seeing here on Wikipedia took place from the 13th of March to the 7th of May in 1954. So this was a month and a half of fighting. In other words, this just wasn't just a couple of days of fighting. I mean, this, this was a battle that stretched itself out over five or six weeks. Oh, yeah, it was huge. The French commander in, in Vietnam, in Indochina, had decided that it would be a great idea to draw the communists out into the open to fight them on French terms where they could appropriately, appropriately use their firepower. And a lot of it was U.S. equipment that we'd given to the French at the end of World War II. And they said, well, the best thing we can do is draw them out, get them out of the jungle, stop them from fighting this low-intensity guerrilla conflict, get them out in the open, and then we will smash them with our huge firepower. So the French, 
went to Dien Bien Phu, which is way out in the western part of North Vietnam on the Laotian border up near China. And they said, we're going to stick our forces at this little airfield out there where we can resupply them by air and we will draw the Viet Minh into battle there because we can shape the battlefield and force them to attack us in the open, at which time we will use our massive firepower, the artillery, tanks, and aircraft to kill the Viet Minh and defeat them. That was the plan. And so was this truly a liberation effort, or was this just French colonialism trying to reassert itself? Well, it was French colonialism trying to reassert itself in Vietnam, but everything had changed, and of course, Ho Chi Minh is portrayed by some as a nationalist. Well, he was a nationalist, but he was more of an internationalist. He was a hardcore communist, and they tried to pretend like he wasn't. This guy had been schooled by the communists in China and Russia. I mean, he was not a pretend socialist. He was a hardcore communist. And so his idea was take control of Vietnam, the entire Vietnam, from the French, which, you know, we know is South and North Vietnam after 54, but up until that time, it was the entire country that ran along the, uh, the sea from China down to, to where it ran into the South China Sea. I mean, it was a, a very long, thin country. And their idea was, we're going to reunite this country using nationalism, but that was a cover, a ploy for the communists. And Ho Chi Minh was going to do this through both political action and military action. And when the China, when the uh, I'm sorry, the uh, French went to Dien Bien Phu, he really had them in their a trap of their own making. What was it about this battle in particular? Because it basically comes out is number nine on a top uh, twelve list. And so, what is it that? put it in the top 10 of, of, you know, the battles that we need to talk about uh, this year or the, you know, the battles that had the most impact on history. This had a major impact on the French because it defeated their military might in Indochina. The French could not send troops from metropolitan France to fight in Indochina. So they used many colonial troops there, Algerians, I mean, they brought them from all over the empire and the French Foreign Legion, which was not constrained to fighting just inside France. So France was really limited on what they could do. They only had an X number of colonial troops and Foreign Legion to send there. They really put themselves in a spot because they decided this was going to be a do or die effort at the Indian food. They had been fighting this guerrilla warfare for nine years um, after the Japanese had been kicked out, and it wasn't working. They just were not able to control the countryside. So they didn't really understand what they were doing in terms of counterinsurgency. They, they looked at this as a nail, and any hammer would, you know, fix the problem. And the hammer was, you know, the military might. But this was a very convoluted problem. It was a very political situation, and the French just didn't get it. So when they sent their commanders to, to uh, Indochina, a lot of these guys had great experience from World War I and World War II, you know, conventional war experience, but it did not suit what was going on with the Viet Minh, who were fighting a massive guerrilla counter or insurgency, and that's just not what the French forces were designed to fight. So they draw the French out into Dien Bien Phu, where the French tried to draw the, the Viet Minh there. And the Viet Minh went there, but they went there with massive conventional forces. And the French never, ever expected that the Viet Minh could get their heavy artillery into the hills surrounding Dien Bien Phu. Dien Bien Phu sat in a bowl. So the French assumed that that Viet Minh could not shell them with their heavy artillery because they would be unable to get the guns into the hills. Well, of course, the French were imposing their standards and norms on the Viet Minh, which didn't work. The Viet Minh 
took the guns apart and carried them by hand up into the mountains. I mean, something that we would never have expected. But these guys were uh, perfectly adept at taking the guns apart piece by piece, moving them up into the mountains, then digging them in around Dien Bien Phu. And that caused a major problem for the French, who never expected to be shelled with heavy artillery like that. So where did these Vietnamese, uh, where did they get all this heavy artillery from? Had it been left over from World War II and abandoned by uh, the Allies or by the Japanese? or I mean, where did they get this stuff? A lot of it was uh, American stuff that had been captured from the French or came from China when, um, you know, the nationalists would lose stuff that communist Chinese would share, so they would help supply the Viet Minh. Um, and then they got lots, you know, that were given as foreign aid from other communist countries. So the stuff was just from, the weapons were from everywhere. They had a very mixed bag of weapons. Whatever they could get their hands on that worked, they would use it. So this was 1954. And when exactly did the United States actually get involved in Vietnam? In 1954, as soon as the French left the country was split into two, into South and North Vietnam. As soon as that happened, the Americans began sending advisors to Vietnam. So we got in, you know, just as the French left, we walked in and started our advisory role with the South Vietnamese military. Why did the American military see the need to get involved in a situation that the French had bailed from? Remember, the Korean War had just ended in 1953. The communist bloc, Warsaw Pact, was a major threat. What we saw is the domino theory being worked out. We figured that one country falls, the next one would fall, and it was a legitimate theory because the communists said they were going to do this. They were going to take all these countries. So it was up to us to try to put a stop to it. And what we were doing is saying, that's as far as you're going. We're drawing a line in the sand. You're not going anymore. We're going to stop you here. And then Southeast Asia Treaty Organization kind of formalized that, said, you know, attack on one is an attack on all. It's like NATO. And so we began making these treaties and making promises to these countries. We're going to keep you from falling to the communists because we know that's what they're going to do. Then the Battle of Dien Bien Phu was a failure, obviously, for the French, as you'd said, that they had used the wrong uh, tactics, basically fighting in that part of the world and fighting, you know, the type of insurgents that they were fighting against. So when the Americans came in, did they learn from the French mistake or did they just go in and, and do the same things, just uh, bigger and louder? I think we learned a lot from the French mistakes. I'll never forget, um, just before my father left for Vietnam, he started reading um, Bernard Ball's books, and that Bernard Ball was an avid writer on the conflicts in Vietnam. And uh, he wrote about Dien Bien Phu, Hell in a Very Small Place, is one of his classics. Another one is Street Without Joy, and it's about the French experience there. So the Americans were reading and learning what the French had done wrong. And I know there's a lot of criticism about the Americans fighting, you know, a conventional war in Vietnam, but we actually did fight a large counterinsurgency, and it was very successful. A lot of people forget that the Viet Cong were emasculated in 1968 during the Tet Offensive. They got whipped really badly. Where we lost is in the court of public opinion because the media turned against us. But we beat them soundly in the, you know, in the field. So the Viet Cong had been quashed. It was, and remember, North Vietnam invaded in 1972 and then 75 in a huge conventional war operation. It wasn't a counter or an insurgency. They beat South Vietnam using a conventional war invasion. It wasn't guerrillas. It was a regular army, the North Vietnamese army that invaded. It was huge. So they used, you know, full spectrum of operations, as we say today, from guerrillas up to using conventional ground forces, armored units. I mean, they, these guys had a lot of stuff. The Soviets and the Chinese 
gave them tons of equipment. They didn't make their own tanks in North Vietnam. They came from China and Russia, Soviet Union. Open your web browser and type in www.barnesreview.org and discover the Barnes Review magazine. There is no more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. You had mentioned the Viet Cong. Uh, what, were the what was the difference between the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh? The Viet Minh were the predecessors to the Viet Cong. The country split. Those that were down south in the 17th parallel that were left behind began the insurgency and guerrilla warfare. They became the Viet Cong. So they were the successors to the Viet Minh who had fought the French. And so you had mentioned that the Americans, when they came in right after the French started withdrawing, that they were meeting and consulting with the South Vietnamese. Are the French responsible for the fact that the South Vietnamese wanted separation uh, from the North? Um, and the French kind of abandoned the South Vietnamese? Or did the Americans have to come in and, and find a group of people and kind of build them up to, to have resistance to a united communist front? I mean, exactly how did that develop? Well, when the French signed the treaty with the Viet Minh at the end of the war, when the Battle of Dien Bien Phu was lost, the French threw the, the uh, flag in and they said, we're done. So they signed the treaty and the, the treaty said, okay, we have all these people here that don't want to be communists. Over a million North Vietnamese fled to the South because they said the South will be a Republic of Vietnam and the North will become uh, the, the communist government will take over the North. But all those people that didn't want to be communists, you know, the French made the agreement that South will be a free country and those people they were mainly Catholics because the Vietnamese were very, I mean, the communist Viet Minh were very anti-Catholic. Mostly the Catholics who had been allied with the French in the North, over a million fled to the South. The country of Republic of Vietnam began at that time. That's when we moved in because the French completely pulled out. That was the agreement, leaving the Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese, high and dry. Of course, the Chinese and the Soviets were in helping the North Vietnamese, and so the South Vietnamese had no chance unless we were another major Western power. There were none that were willing to do it. French couldn't do it because they signed a treaty to leave. You know, it left us holding the bag. And so the French must have had some kind of bargaining power, or else why would the, why would the communists in the North have even cut that kind of a deal where they would basically agree to limit themselves to uh, the northern part of the country? So the fact that the French could get, you know, that kind of a concession and allow a million people to move to the south, and obviously the French had enough bargaining power that it begs the question, why were they leaving the country? Well, the government of France said they were cutting off all the funding. They would no longer support military operations in Vietnam and left the military, French military hanging. The treaty was designed, and of course the communists have broken every treaty in the world. They've never stuck to their treaty. It was just a temporary pause in their uh, quest to occupy South Vietnam and reunite it with the North. You know, they saw it as just a, a operational pause, not as a done deal forever and ever. So what they did is they installed their communist uh, subversive in South Vietnam to try to take the South through subversion. And that was the Viet Cong. Extra, extra, we all about it. If you're like me, and I'll bet you are, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door, packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Extra, extra, read all about it.
Okay, so I've got to ask you a question, and maybe this is just coincidence, or maybe there's a deeper underlying philosophy and conspiracy here. But I'm seeing a pattern. You had the communists in, in the North and the non-communists in the South in Korea. You had the communists in the North, the non-communists in the South in uh, Vietnam. You know, you could even go to the United States. You had you had the Marxist utopians in the North and, and you had the good guys in the South in the United States. Is there a reason for that? I mean, is, I mean was total, it coincidence? Was it geography? Fluke. Was it was it philosophy? What was it? Total fluke of history. Yeah, I thought about that myself. Yeah, it's just total fluke. Of course, North Vietnam and North Korea border with communist China. And so it makes sense. You know, the communists wanted that is a secure communist country next to them. They would not want the Republic of Vietnam there. And so they could resupply and support the North Vietnamese. And they did. And they resupplied and supported the, the North Koreans, which they do. Now, of course, the Chinese, the Red Chinese and the Vietnamese are no longer friends. Starting in 79, things went down very fast, and they had a war in 79, and it's been bad relations since then. So now we are playing the North, or not the North Vietnamese, the Vietnamese against the Chinese. We've become the BFFs for the Vietnamese. We send ships over. We have exchange programs now. We bring their military to the United States to be trained. And the reason is it scares the Chinese. They don't have a secure southern border. They know the Vietnamese are not their buddies. And if they're friends with us, that makes it worse. So going back to the 1950s, you know, you had Ho Chi Minh in, in uh, Indochina or Vietnam. You had Ho Chi Minh, not Ho Chi Minh. You had Mao Zedong in China. You had uh, Kim Il Sun in uh, North Korea. Were these, did, did Marxism unite them and give them kind of a friendship or a kinship? Or were there other things in Asia that basically would have made them natural enemies of each other despite their Marxism? Um, China and the, the Vietnamese have been at war for thousands of years. The Vietnamese do not trust the Chinese. The Chinese have invaded and, and taken Vietnam um, in the past. So there's, there's this hard feelings between them for that. But as you point out, the common goal of Marxism, you know, brought them together to fight against the capitalist, you know, the Americans. And so when that was done in 79, they had a major border dispute between the Viet, North Viet, well, let me restate that, between Vietnam, it was united by then, and China, and they went to a major shooting war on the Chinese border. And interestingly enough, the Vietnamese beat the living snot out of the Chinese. In Vietnam, for example, you know, veterans that I've talked to in Vietnam have told me this, and, and I'm sure you had a similar experience, that they never really knew who the enemy was. Because, I mean, they could walk into a store to buy a drink, and the enemy's there. The little kid, you know, playing with the stick in his ball in the street could have been the enemy. You know, they just, they didn't quite know who the enemy was. Does that mean that a lot of the people living in the South were actually sympathetic toward, you know, toward the, uh, the North... And, uh, and the communists and so forth and, and saw the American uh, GIs as the invaders. And I'm asking that question as a setup going back to the Battle of uh, D and B and Fu. You know, did those same people basically see the French not as, you know, as allies or someone who was trying to liberate them, but again, as an invader? Yeah, two completely different situations. The Vietnamese were colonized by France. When colonial powers move in, they tend to pillage the country that they're colonizing. And I use pillage, it's a little rough, but they took advantage of it. And economically, they were making lots of money off of Vietnam that was not benefiting the Vietnamese, it was benefiting the French. Did it benefit the Vietnamese? Well, yeah, sort of. Um, the they might have got a few stole. paved roads out of it, right? They, they what? I said they might have got a few paved roads out of it, right? And they got schools. They got an administrative system set up. But, you know, the idea wasn't to help the Vietnamese. It was to use Vietnam as a source of resources in order to make France stronger. So 
the Vietnamese, you know, may have, you know, gotten a few byproducts. But the whole point is, it was a colonial relationship. The Americans did not go in there to colonize. And generally speaking, the Vietnamese like the Americans because we did stuff to help the Vietnamese. You know, we built schools, we did things, you know, civic action programs to help them, you know, modernize and help themselves. The problem is, and, and we're dealing with cultures that are totally different. We go into countries and want to install our culture. It doesn't work. Their culture is thousands of years old. The way they do business is very different. So corruption, which is endemic in most of the, you know, the, the world, other than you know our country where we only have little corruption, haha, uh -huh, um, you know they had massive corruption, and it's just part of the culture. We ran into it in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's just part of their society. So trying to tell them not to be corrupt is like trying to get them to change the color of their eyes. It's just not going to work. And while there were many good Vietnamese, the ones that were bad, that, you know, were corrupt, caused big problems. Now, the communists have corruption, but they tend to be a little more brutal about it. If they get people who are corrupt, they tend to take them out and shoot them. <laughs> That's just the way they deal with it. Um, so if you survive as a corrupt Chinese or North Vietnamese communist, you know, you're well protected. But if they find you... You know, they take you out and shoot you. Well, well, it's I'm going to ask a question here, and and maybe it's an unfair question to ask you, uh, because it's outside of your area of expertise, that being military history. But for example, in Mexico, I'm driving down the road. I get pulled over by a policeman. He really doesn't want to give me any grief. He really doesn't want to write me a ticket. Really, all he wants me to do is pull five dollars out of my wallet and hand it to him. Yes. Corruption. Yep. Now, exactly. now in America, I get pulled over by a policeman. He's going to shake me down for hundreds of dollars, but because it's legitimized through a process of 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 courts, we don't see that as corruption. But I'm going to ask the question: Who's really corrupt and who's really not? Yeah. Well, like I I said, ha ha. Um, you know, the corruptions. We've got tons of corruption here. It's just not as blatant in a lot of cases. But it's here. We got it. And it's very frustrating, as you know. But, you know, in their system, um, who you know, mm -hmm. you know, who you pay off, we don't, you know, to go down and get a, a driver's license here, you go down, generally it's, you don't have to deal with that kind of stuff. You deal with bureaucrat pinheads, but there you have to pay people off. And that's, you know, that causes great angst with American soldiers going to Afghanistan and Iraq. And we've talked about this in our ethics classes and everything else. What do you do? Because the only way you're going to get stuff done is to pay them off. And so the Army, you know, came up, or the military did, with this system of legally paying them off, even though it goes against our grain. And so do you think that that was the reason why the French weren't successful? Do you think that it was a matter of, of being uh, overwhelmed militarily, or do you think they just weren't willing to play the game, and that's why they didn't succeed. I think there's a number of reasons they didn't succeed, but the will of the people in France was get the heck out of Dodge. Um, they had just gone through World War II, and now they're back being colonialist, and colonialism, remember, after World War II, was on the downswing. The, the British, the French, everybody was divesting themselves of their colonies, and here's France trying to rebuild and put the colonies back into to order and go back and be colonial power again. You know, everywhere else in Africa, you know, people, India was, you know, decolonized by the British. They gave the, the Indians their freedom. It's just, uh, it was the wrong time. And then, of course, the French military didn't get it. They they thought they had lost World War One and, and pretty much, not World War One, World War Two. they pretty much had been whacked in World War One because they didn't know how to fight the conventional war. They could fix that and go back and fight it and win in, in into China. The problem is someone forgot to tell the Vietnamese to fight using the same playbook the French had. And they used counterinsurgency up until Dien Bien Phu, which was a major conventional battle. So at Dien Bien Phu, were the Vietnamese 
were they reinforced by Soviet troops or by Chinese troops or by anyone, or were they strictly fighting, uh, you know, by themselves? They they were fighting by themselves. They may have had advisors, Chinese advisors, but they were fighting by themselves. They had massive influx of material that came through China that made them successful. For example, the anti-aircraft guns were Soviet anti-aircraft guns that the Chinese just funneled right down to the Viet Minh. That's what caused a major problem because the French said, we can resupply our army using air power, which sounded great, except someone forgot to tell the the French that any aircraft guns will shoot them down, and they didn't think the Viet Minh had that capability. But when they showed up with all their aircraft, there was a huge anti-aircraft matrix surrounding Diem Diem Phu in the mountains, and they started shooting French aircraft down right and left. So resupplying, even sending in the paratroop reinforcements was a major problem. They couldn't fly low enough, and the paratroops had to be let out much higher. It caused a lot of problems for the French. And so then the Vietnamese in Diem Diem Phu, uh, you know, they had all of these any aircraft weapons, they, they had all the military munitions, if they will, that they needed to be successful. But obviously somebody would have had to have trained them in how to use these things. You're talking about the French? Well, I'm talking about the Vietnamese. I mean, I would assume that the French oh, would have yeah. been veteran soldiers and would have known how to use their, their stuff. But the Vietnamese, oh, yeah. it, it's not enough just to give them a bunch of guns and a bunch of anti-aircraft weapons and everything else and say, okay, go at it. I mean, somebody obviously had to teach them how to use these things. Well, that's where the Chinese advisors came in. And, of course, they've been fighting for nine years. A lot of these guys had gone off to China or the Soviet Union to be schooled. They were so close to the Chinese border, it would have been nothing for the Chinese to send their advisors over to help them. But after nine years, they figured out how to use those weapons pretty well. The French, obviously, uh, did they have any experience that would have translated into uh, fighting there in Vietnam. I mean, for example, you know, the Americans had fought in all kinds of different climates throughout Asia, so I'm sure some of the islands and some of the places where they had fought, you know, would have had um, would have had vegetation and climate and geography that would have been similar to Vietnam. But what about the French? I mean, did the French have any experience, say, maybe from World War II, that uh, would have prepared them for the fighting in Vietnam, or were they just in a t- in a jungle that they just weren't prepared to, to function? Well, in? they they actually should have done well because, well, the late 1800s, they colonized in Africa, and they fought a counterinsurgency in Algeria the first time in the late 1800s. So. The answer is, yeah, they should have had the doctrine, they should have had the experience, but it was forgotten over the years. And they they looked at the problem in Vietnam using the wrong glasses, and what they thought they saw was a conventional response to a conventional war, and it was wrong. If they had applied what they learned in North Africa, you know, the counterinsurgency doctrine they developed in the 1800s, they might have done a lot better, but they were looking at it through the wrong lenses. What they saw was a conventional problem when in fact it was a counterinsurgency problem. Welcome to the Christendom curriculum. You know, every parent who decides to homeschool wants to secure a great education for their child while also saving time and money. But these days, many parents have another concern. They also want a homeschool curriculum without all the multiculturalist, politically correct diversity doctrine that's really little more than a thin disguise for an anti-Christian, anti-American, and anti-Western civilization bias. The Christendom curriculum gives your children a complete education in Bible, history, literature, and more, focusing on the classic academic skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic. The Christendom Curriculum is the only Christian nationalist homeschool program you'll find. So if you want to help raise the next generation of culture warriors, if you want your children to grow up with a love for Christ's kingdom and for their own nation, 
while at the same time learning how to defend America and rebuild the West, the easy-to-use Christendom curriculum is for you. Click the Learn More button to get in on the action. And thanks for listening. And so I'm looking at Vietnam on a map, and of course, you know, Korea, and we talked about that last month. You know, Korea is a lot further north. It gets very cold in Korea. Vietnam is down uh, very close to the equator. It's more along the same lines weather-wise, I'm going to say, probably with the Philippines. And so I'm going to guess it was just hot and muggy and hot and sweaty and hot and sticky all the time. Depending on what part of the year and where you were, um, if you go into the highlands away from the coast of Vietnam, um, the weather's somewhat different. And, of course, during monsoon, you know, that's when the rain occurs. So it just pours all the time, and then it dries out later on. So it depends on where you're located. It's a big country. I mean, it extends a very long distance. Um, yeah, it's a long and a skinny of, country. I'm sorry? It's a long and skinny country. I took a map of Vietnam and stuck it on the eastern United States, and the tip of South Vietnam hits the Gulf Coast and the top of North Vietnam hits the Canadian border almost. So, you know, that's a long place to, and you think about the weather differences in the United States from the Gulf Coast all the way up to Michigan on the Canadian border. You know, that's kind of what you fall into. And of course, you get away from the coastal plains and then you get into the mountains and the weather is different there. So it's a tropical, subtropical climb. Was D&B and Fu like a one-and-done deal for the French, or had the French had some activity trying to reestablish their colony before D&B and Fu? They'd had a lot of problems since uh, before D&B and Fu. When they went back in in 1945, because of the gap in time when the Japanese surrendered and the time the first ship with French troops arrived, the Viet Minh under... Ho Chi Minh had time to establish their own shadow government, which they used very effectively. And so the war started immediately back up in 45 with the Viet Minh fighting against the French occupation. And the French tried several different techniques under different commanders to win the war by putting in blockhouses to cordon off parts of Vietnam and It didn't work because the guerrillas could seamlessly flow between the areas that were blocked off, guarded by the French, and get right into them and get to the back of their their position. So, you know, you talked about the Americans saying not knowing who the enemy is, and that's what happens in this guerrilla war. Vietnamese look like Vietnamese, look like other Vietnamese. So how do you know a guy's a communist if he's not wearing a communist uniform? And, of course, the guerrillas fought in their everyday clothes, you know, it was very frustrating for the French, as it was for us. Because when you're fighting a guerrilla war, it's very difficult to determine who the good guys are and the bad guys. Because they don't wear a uniform. And you can't tell by looking at them who the communist is and the non-communist. There is a difference, you know, with the North Vietnamese regular army. They wore regular uniforms. And you could very easily tell who they were you've seen the movie We Were Soldiers Once and Young, those weren't guerrillas they were fighting in the movie. That was North Vietnamese regular army units. They wore regular army uniforms. You could tell by what they were wearing who they were. Dean B and Fu, was it, you said that you'd mentioned anti-aircraft weapons before, so I'm guessing that the French had a strong air presence? Yes, very strong. We gave them tons of aircraft after World War II as military assistance. And uh, they were flying American aircraft using uh, um, C-47s, C-119 boxcars to reinforce the garrison there by dropping supplies by parachute. But those aircraft, in order to drop a parachute load, had to fly low in order for them to get it inside the wire of the the fortress in Dembian Fu. The lower they flew, the the better targets they were for the Vietnamese anti-aircraft guns. And so it forced the French to fly higher, and a lot of the supplies they started dropping 
in the latter part of the the battle landed outside the wire. The Vietnamese got the, the supplies. And so I'm also seeing some pictures here of the battle, and I'm seeing what looks like a chaffee tank. And so I'm guessing that the Americans must have uh, given the French uh, some surplus tanks. They did. They gave them those M24 tanks, and the French took them apart and airdropped them in, or flew parts into them, and then rebuilt them on the ground. And so were those effective at all for the for the French, or, or did the uh, Viet Minh already have the, uh, the artillery ready to, uh, to take out those tanks? Well, the artillery really wouldn't do much to a tank. I mean, it might break the radial aerials and all, but what it, the French were unable to do much with them. I mean, they became more targets than anything else. And so, you know, they were unable to maneuver outside the fortress which is where they wanted to go, but they couldn't. Once you left the wire, then you were in real danger of, you know, being overwhelmed by the Viet Minh. So the tanks really didn't do a whole lot for the French there. It was a uh, psychological thing to have them, but they were unable to really contribute much to the uh, to the defense. And I'm also looking at a picture here, and I can tell these have to be French soldiers because there's nothing Asian looking about them at all. But it almost looks like a World War I picture. I mean, they're down in trenches. Was there a lot of trench warfare there, or is this just kind of a oh, yes. picture? Oh, Ab- yes. Absolutely was. Um, the, the whole battle of Dien Bien Phu was French fighting from a fixed defense, deliberate defense. And they dug massive trenches, lots of uh, bunkers, and they had several forts that were inside the defensive zone there that they had. So... The airfield was the center of the defense. They had to keep the airfield in order to be resupplied. And that's a large area. So they built forts around it. And the forts within the forts had bunkers and trenches inside. There were four major forts, Huguet, Claudine, Elaine, and Dominique. And they were guarding the airstrip. That, the whole purpose of putting them around the airstrip was to keep the airstrip free for aircraft. Once those forts started falling, the airstrip was in danger. So was this a strategic mistake on the part of the French then, trying to, to basically, uh, you know, dig trenches and, and basically fight from a fixed position rather than, than expanding their their territory? Um, I mean, it, it sounds was, like the French were fighting a defensive war in what should have been an offensive field. It was more of an, it was more of an operational level rather than strategic problem. They decided to put themselves in a place that was untenable because they made incorrect assumptions about the enemy forces. I mean, it sounds like a good idea on paper, but the assumptions by which they used to put the forts or put Dien Bien Phu as a strong point was, were faulty. You know, they didn't realize that the artillery that the Viet Minh had could be pulled up into the hills, the mountains, by people. Because the French would have never done that. They would have said, that's impossible. There's no way for a truck to take the howitzers up into the mountains. The Viet Minh didn't have trucks. They took the doggone things apart and portered them up there by hundreds of coolies, which, you know, just out of the mind of the French. They, 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 they didn't understand how the Asian mind worked. Viet Minh brought the artillery in, dug it in into the hills so it couldn't be seen by the airplanes, and when it could be seen, it couldn't be bombed because it was dug into caves in the, in the mountains. The other thing is the, the Viet Minh negated French air power by bringing in massive amounts of anti-aircraft guns. And that was a major problem for the, Viet, for the French because they thought, if nothing else, we have this air power and we can just bomb the living snot out of them and strafe them and they can't do anything about it. Well, they didn't figure these air, any aircraft guns were going to be brought in. So they got countered in two major issues that they made faulty assumptions on that turned out to be totally um, their undoing. Dien Bien Phu could not be reinforced by land. The, everything between, between Dien Bien Phu and Hai, Hai, um, Hanoi was owned by the communists. You know, so it was been impossible to drive trucks there. They had to do it by air, 
And because they made the faulty assumption about the Viet Minh having any aircraft guns and being able to use them effectively, uh, that undid their plans. Hello, I'm Tom Strain, Lieutenant Commander in Chief of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. The Confederate flag, Confederate symbols, and the reputation of our Confederate ancestors has come under attack. Please visit scbheritagedefense.org and make a donation to the Heritage Defense Fund. We hope that you will join us in the fight to defend the Confederate soldier's good name. talking about the only way they could be reinforced was by air and the Viet Minh had tremendous anti-aircraft capability so were they just literally shooting the supply planes out of the sky and the supplies were never coming in yes and no because as soon as a supply plane would come in low to drop parachutes they get shot down so the solution was okay we will go higher we will drop the parachutes much higher well great the higher you go, the less accuracy you have, and the parachutes tended to float outside the wire, so only part of the supplies were getting into the to the defensive lines. That meant that they were running out of food and ammunition, and that that caused a major problem. They just couldn't couldn't get enough supplies by air. This is like the Germans at Stalingrad. You know, remember Hermann Göring said he would resupply Stalingrad. And they could only get about a tenth of what they needed a day by the Luftwaffe. Well, the French ran into the same problem. I, I always remind my Air Force buddies, you know, air power is great, except when the other guy has stuff to counter it. I look at World War One. I. I look at World War Two. The French didn't look so good. You know, maybe there's something to that saying that the French are lovers, not fighters. Uh, you know, the French military doesn't have a very good success rate. You know, so Vietnam just seems like another one in a long string of uh, of French failures. The two world wars having been, you know, the, the the last couple. Is there a reason for that? I think there is. The French military, you know, became soft. There were there are a number of reasons. Although, if I had to have a foreign unit next to me, I wouldn't mind having a French foreign legion unit next to me. Not that they're French, a lot of them are not, but they're run by the French, and they're very, very soldiers. I mean, those are the kind of guys you want to have as your friends. But the regular French army, you know, their education system, it, it just, they flubbed. They flubbed World War One. they flubbed World War Two, and they flubbed it in Vietnam. It's not because the French Foreign Legion didn't fight hard, but the guys in charge were, you know, the French army and the regular guys, and they flubbed it. So they're not kind of guys I would look at as being my kind of allies. I wouldn't want to have to, to work with them. But I remember, uh, you know, however many years ago, reading a speech by Charles de Gaulle, and he was basically telling the Americans, you know, get out of Vietnam. And, of course, he died in 1970. So, uh, you know, this was a speech I think was given in the late 60s right before he died. And so de Gaulle, you know, would have been kind of in his, you know, maybe his prime, maybe just shortly after his prime, you know, maybe at the beginning of, of the downward whatever. But still, you know, de Gaulle would have still been in, in, in good form, I would think, during the time. So was de Gaulle at all involved in this or, or no? Yeah, he was humiliated by the loss to France. I mean, their prestige mm -hmm. took another massive blow. Was de Gaulle um, commanding think, the troops in D and B and Fu, or, or? Oh no, no, no. Okay. He he was by that time he was a politician. The problem is, I think the French were so embarrassed they didn't want to see anybody succeed, and so they were telling us get out. Well, yeah, okay, we'll get out. But the problem is, I think they were humiliated and they didn't want to see us do well. That's my guess. Mm -hmm. So, so you were talking about uh, D and B and Fu, and it was surrounded by mountains, and it was the only way they could uh, get to it was by air. They couldn't get to it by truck. They couldn't march through it, and so forth. You know that kind of sounds to me a lot like Afghanistan. And of course, you know the Soviets spent however many years and however many dollars and however many uh, gallons of blood 
in Afghanistan and got nowhere. And now the United States has been in the same place thinking that somehow or another we were magically going to perform better in Afghanistan than the Russians did. And we're seeing how that turned out. But um, was Dean Bien Phu in that part of Vietnam, was it kind of like Afghanistan, just an indefensible place, uh, a place that, that the enemy can just dig in and you can't get to them by, by air, land, or water? Yes and no. Um, it's a, you know, in a underdeveloped country that Vietnam was, especially at that time, <clears throat> it was in the middle of nowhere and not being able to support it by ground forces was a major mistake. They, they just assumed that air power was going to be able to do it. <clears throat> Again, you know, that major faulty logic they didn't analyze the enemy and the terrain to come up with the correct analysis. They assumed that they would be able to flog the Vietnamese to death with air power, and the Vietnamese couldn't do anything about it. And the wrong assumption, the Vietnamese brought all that heavy gear through the jungles, you know, man packing it in there, and, you know, beat the snot out of them. Depends on the application, because remember, you know, that's right on the border with Laos, and you have other problems with crossing borders and, you know, involving other countries. And then you have China that's very close to the north was where the supply line was coming down from. So, you know, what do you do? Do you attack China? Do you go into to Laos and expand the war? You know, you're asking for, for something you may not be able to deal with. So they had all sorts of problems. So the French, you know, were there for about six weeks and then they gave up and went home. Was it because there was nothing to gain? In other words, when they had reasserted themselves in, into China, was there still something politically, economically to be gained there? Or were they just going back just to reassert themselves for the sake of reasserting themselves? I think it was both. I think, you know, a matter of pride having a colony. But the rubber plantations, the Michelin plantation was a big deal. I mean, they were getting a lot of stuff out of Vietnam. You know, I think the uh, the people that own Michelin plantations made deals with the communists, you know, not to screw with them. They would pay, you know, protection money to them, sort of like the gangs in New York. Right. You know, we'll pay you if you just leave us alone so we can sell our rubber. Well, I'm going to guess the communists needed a revenue stream, and so that probably worked out really well for both sides. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So do you think the French had taken that approach, that, that Vietnam would still be French today? No, I don't think so. I think that the French, because of their, their, their total focus on being a colonial power and how they treated the Vietnamese, it would have quickly collapsed in, within 20 years had the Viet Minh not been there. Remember, all the colonies in, in Africa were getting their independence from Britain. I think that, you know, the, the standard had been set that everybody was getting their freedom. They would have eventually gotten theirs. So, you know, there are idealistic Marxists and there are opportunistic Marxists. And I've always believed the Soviet Union were opportunistic Marxists. <clears throat> but Ho Chi Minh, yeah. Ho Chi Minh, do you believe that he was an idealistic Marxist or an opportunist Marxist? I think it was a combination of both. Um, you know, he, he claimed he was a nationalist. He may well have been, but he was more of a Marxist, uh, you know, a communist. Um, and people try to downplay that. There was a series done for TV back in the 80s. Absolutely terrible. Um, I, I forgot what it's called now. The series came out in a number of videotapes. All the schools got them. Uh, I think it's TV's Vietnam. It was put out by CBS, Communist Broadcasting System. Absolutely terrible series. You talk about biased, pro-communist bias. Um, there's an organization called Accuracy and Media came out with a rebuttal to it a number of years later. It was uh, narrated by Charlton Heston. In fact, I still have the VHS. 
I had it converted to a DVD. But it is an excellent rebuttal, you know, to the the garbage that they put out on that CBS special. It's the CBS special is pro communist garbage. But what it said is, Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist, not a communist. That's baloney. It goes against all the evidence. And, you know, that's just revisionist history put out by these left-wing academicians that think, well, if we say it so, it's got to be true. And, of course, the Charlton Heston's uh, video, the accuracy in media with Charlton Heston speaking, completely debunks that series. It's a great uh, two-hour video with a lot of historical uh, data in there and his- historians that were not consulted by CBS because they wouldn't have spouted the bureaucratic CBS line. Is there another strategy that the French could have implemented and could have potentially saw success there, or were they just in a place where they shouldn't have been and had had no hope or prayer of ever having prevailed? I think if they had gone in there with a more um, cooperative look instead of reasserting colonialism, putting their people in control, is helping the Vietnamese to take control of their own country, and the Vietnamese would be their friends today. But what they did is they went back in, the typical arrogance, we're in charge, you do what we say, and that doesn't work real well with people who, you know, have been mistreated by the Japanese and and seeing other colonies around the world gain their freedom. And when you had people, agitators like Ho Chi Minh, who rightly so thought that they should be free, but... His, his vision was under communism, which was not what the French wanted. You know, if the French had gone in there um, less paternalistically and looked at the Vietnamese as friends instead of as uh, subject, colonial subjects, things might have turned out a lot different. And so when you were teaching military history at the Army Staff College and you were talking about the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, what was the takeaway that you wanted your students to get from this? Know your enemy. Don't underestimate them. And we studied Dien Bien Phu. Um, Know your enemy. Know that just because you wouldn't do something doesn't mean they won't do something. You know, the French said we would never be able to drive our trucks up, put the artillery on the hills. Well, guess what? The Vietnamese didn't have trucks, but they had millions of men, and they used used them to take the guns apart and cart them up one piece at a time. So, you know, know your enemy. You know, be able to think like he does. Don't get constrained. That was a big thing. I guess the second big thing that we taught them is know what kind of fight you're in. Um And we're talking about Vietnam as a whole. You know, just because you have a great conventional army, don't think that the other guy is going to fight you on your terms in a conventional war. You know, and this is what we were teaching in terms of getting our guys ready to go to Afghanistan and Iraq. Said, you know, unconventional war, counterinsurgency may be how you have to fight this war. So when we invaded Iraq with our conventional forces, and after a week or two, the the bad guys are subdued, it turned from a major conventional war into a major unconventional war and insurgency. So, you know, be flexible, understand that things can change. And just because you want to fight conventionally doesn't mean the other guy does. And so then what was the big question that I failed to ask today? Why didn't the French use nuclear weapons? Okay, that's not a question I was expecting, but why didn't the French use nuclear weapons? Because we refused to let them. They asked us to nuke the uh, Viet Minh. They wanted us to actually use our nuclear weapons to nuke the Viet Minh. And President Eisenhower said, no way, we were not going to do that. And that, might I say, is just mind-blowing that the French would be so arrogant that they would want the United States to nuke Vietnam just so that they could maintain some, you know, backwater uh, rice paddy colony. It's just mind-blowing. But we do have to cut the interview off there because we are out of time for this week's TBR Radio Presents, the TBR History Hour. Come back same time, same place next week. We'll have another great interview for you, another great show. Until then, go to our website, www.barnesreview.org. 
find out everything you can about the Barnes Review and how you can get your hands on this supersized September-October issue of the Barnes Review magazine. Anyways, again, I'm out of time. I gotta go, but I'll be with you again next week. Until then, God bless.